Hello, I'm back. This is Gabe Palmer, and we're going to be talking about threads and communication today. Uh, this is one of the first points where you're going to know that I've lied to you significantly. Um, I, we've always been talking about processes as the means to execution in a system. Today, we find out that threads are really what we're talking about when we're talking about a flow of control through the system. So threads are a flow of control, a sequential bit of execution through a process's code. So the thread is actually the register state that changes as a process executes, right? So everything that we've been talking about effectively about processes having to do with execution, having to do with register sets, um, and actually having to do with the execution stack, that's effectively a thread. So um, to be explicit, each of these threads consists of a register state, um, which does include the instruction counter, stack pointer, stuff like that, an execution stack that the stack pointer um, executes on, and as the process executes, it simply modifies this register state and does a normal execution thing. There can now be multiple threads within a single process. So this is called a multi-threaded application, and they are very, very common. Um, and the whole idea now is that we can have multiple execution stacks, one for each of the threads, multiple register states um, within the same virtual address space. So processes now are really two things. They're a virtual address space, as we've talked about before, and now one or more threads, all right? So that's the full view of kind of how we think about execution in the system as processes being a collection of multiple threads. A process, as we've learned up till now, simply has one thread within it, right? Um, the weird thing about threads is that because they share the same virtual address space, they share the same code, they share the same data, um, and they share all of the processes resources, things like file descriptors. So because they share memory, all of a sudden we have to start worrying a lot about how they can access the same data structures at the same time without causing problems. Indeed, one of the things that we're going to talk about next class after this is going to be synchronization, and that's going to be a pretty deep dive. Um, one thing that I want you to think about as well is that this actually changes how we think about context switches a little bit. Uh, we've talked about context switches as mainly consisting of saving the previous um, processes registers. Now you know that's a thread. We save the previous threads registers and switch to the next threads registers. Um, but we also talked about when we need to switch between processes, we also need to change the virtual address space context. Um, and that is something that we don't need to do when we're switching between threads within the same process. So switching between threads within the same process is actually faster. Okay, how do we visualize this? Here's kind of a, a crappy visualization that I stole from the book. Um, on the left, we see a single threaded process. We have one thread executing in the system that in, in the process, sorry, as a register context, has stack, has code data, and like low open file descriptors. Now in a multi-threaded process, we can see that all three of these threads share the same code data and file descriptors, whereas they have separate registers and execution stacks. Um, this may be a little confusing. You might think, but like a stack is at a place in a virtual address space. Indeed it is. And all that this is saying is that the different threads have stacks at different locations within the same virtual address space. There are multiple ways to implement threads. And we're going to go through three different types of threads um, now. The one that you're actually familiar with, the one that you're most kind of already acclimated to, is what's called one-to-one -one or user kernel threads. And the idea behind these is that they're kind of, I don't know, execution as normal as we've been talking about in the system. So they need to be scheduled by the kernel, which means switching between them is performed by the kernel. Um, they execute at user level as per normal. Um, the only change now is that we can have multiple of these threads at user level. The gray things are the stacks, as you can see, and the little uh, um, thread executing within the process kind of emulates the flow of control through a code segment, right? <coughs> Um, and they can make system calls to the kernel, 
um, when we do call down to the kernel and for instance one of the threads might want to block then we might remove it from the running state put it in the blocking state and the scheduler might decide to execute the other thread within the process and in doing so it might context switch to it and as I said before this is really cool because now we no longer need to actually switch between virtual address spaces right um, so Threads have an inherent benefit. One, they share a whole bunch of stuff. Most notably, they share data. When we implemented Forkanachi, you kind of got the indication that it's actually a little painful to, um, uh, to use fork, for instance, for passing a whole bunch of data to and fro different processes, right? Um, IPC is the same way. Threads have the benefit that you share all data. So it's trivial to share things between threads, but it also means that you need to coordinate between those threads on accessing that data, which we'll talk about next time. Um, as you can see, Penny is rolling around in threads. She loves threads. She's a big fan. Um, so. One-to-one -one threads faster than switching between different processes because we don't need to switch between virtual address spaces, but um, you do need to make system calls to actually switch between them. So the atoms involved, the hardware atoms involved, definitely include system calls and context switches, but not necessarily switching between the virtual address spaces of separate processes because the same uh, virtual address space can stay active. However, of course, if we need to switch between two threads that are in separate processes, well, there, you're back to kind of heavyweight switching between virtual address spaces. This kind of points out that there are kind of a, a kernel part of um, these threads. And if we only look at the kernel part of these threads, the kernel stacks that we execute on and the register state when executing in the kernel, we can actually see that you might actually have some um, execution within the system that are called kernel threads, which is to say these are threads that only execute within the kernel. They never do like a system call return. They never do anything like that. They are actually executing usually in infinite loops within the kernel, right? So they wake up, they do some processing that the kernel might find useful. Um, one example of this, for instance, might be waking up periodically to send packets out. Sometimes you need to wait for some delay, and if there's been some sort of an error in sending a packet, you might need to resend it. So you have a kernel thread that just wakes up periodically to check to see whether it needs to send those packets out. Um, obviously, because these threads are scheduled within the kernel, they are scheduled by the kernel. Um, and, of course, they have their own register state, they have their own kernel stack, etc. Now, switching between them is very, very fast, because no matter which virtual address space is active, the kernel is mapped identically into that virtual address space. So, we can always switch to a, a kernel thread, because it's executing in that shared virtual region that belongs to the kernel in every single virtual address space. Um, so it's just a normal context switch, switching register state to switch to a kernel thread. So kernel threads are immensely fast to switch between. Um, and actually, it's very fast to switch to a kernel thread, even if you're um, in a one-to-one -one thread. Um, and that's just because, yeah, the kernel, wherever the kernel thread is executing, it is present within the current execution. <clears throat> okay, now the last implementation of threads that I kind of want to um, go into a little bit is a little bit of a strange one. It's called user level threads, or as we'll see later, M to one threads. So user level threads, as you see in the picture on the right, are essentially the user portion of the threads look the same as in one-to-one -one threads. We have a separate execution stack. We have different separate register contexts for each of the threads. However, from the kernel's perspective, there's only one structure tracking a thread's execution. So the kernel does not see multiple threads. So user level can switch between these threads by implementing the context switching code we've seen previously in user level. And it's important to note that that context switching code that we saw does not actually, if all that it's doing is saving and restoring register context, does not have any sensitive instructions. So that can be done at user level. So with user level threads, we can switch to and fro these different user level threads very, very quickly, simply because 
um, we don't need to make a system call for them. However, if any of these threads make some sort of a blocking system call, so remember blocking means that we go to sleep um, or we, we block until some uh, event happens in the future. That might be communication from another process. It might be an interrupt at some non-deterministic point in the future, right? So what happens there is when one of these user level threads makes a system call because the kernel does not know about all of these user level threads it will actually treat them all as a single thread and the blocking call will block all of them so this is really really bad because now even though just one of those user level threads executed some sort of a blocking operation they all end up needing to block right okay so <clears throat> At user level, if we're executing within these threads, Penny, Penny's playing in the background, squeaking her thing. I apologize. You know, the lack of respect. She doesn't really appreciate academia. Um, so if you want to switch between these different threads, as I said, you just execute the context switch code. And you typically need to explicitly call it in some way. Um, it's somewhat difficult to get preemptions at user level. So often threads must call yield or some sort of a call that essentially says, it's okay to switch away from me right now, um, to switch to another thread. So this is called cooperative switching. And the core idea, the core reason that we require cooperative switching in many cases for user level threads is simply that there's no way to preempt, to interrupt a thread that's executing at user level and get a notification of such so that we can switch to another thread. Remember that one of the main ways that we implemented kind of context switches based on interrupts in the kernel was literally interrupts. We had like timer interrupts that would come in and during a timer interrupt, we might switch away from a thread and switch to another one. Therefore, we would preempt that other thread. However, in user level, it's very hard to figure out how we can actually preempt a thread that's running at user level because the interrupts are at the kernel and the kernel only sees all of those user level threads as one thread. So the kernel can't really do a context switch between those threads, right? Um, there are ways to get around this, but it's more complicated than I want to get into in this paper. Um, there is a paper on the GW Systems YouTube where we actually implemented an interesting way to provide the benefits of user level threads without any of the downsides, right? Um, so the benefits, again, are that because all of the context switching code can be at user level, can be lightning fast, it can be very, very quick on the order of um, probably um, 10 to 50 cycles, depending on the system. Um, we don't need to make a system call, so there are very few atoms involved here, right? But again, the big, big downside is if one of these user level threads makes a system call to block, the kernel doesn't see all of those user level threads. So therefore, when it blocks the thread, it essentially stops all of those user level threads from blocking. The other downside is that it actually does not support parallelism. If you only have one thread down in the kernel, then um, that's it. You have the kernel only knows about that one thread. It can only execute it on one core. So you have to go to a more complicated system where you do in some way have more threads down in the kernel if you want um, to support parallelism. So here's just another visual kind of nomenclature for uh, describing one-to-one -one threads. We have the user level threads that execute at user level and there are the kernel level threads um, backing each of those user level threads. Therefore, if a user level context makes a system call that blocks, the kernel knows about the kernel thread and can block it independent of the rest of the user level threads that are executing within the process. Uh, this is the typical thing that you see in most systems. Um, Java uses this, pthreads use this. Um, pretty much every operating system that I know of, with some exceptions in Windows actually, um, effectively useless. 
Uh, many to one, or as I said, this is called an M to one as well, where M is like a variable number of threads in user level to one kernel thread, um, is used by a number of language systems. Um, this is old data. These systems might have used it, but at some point, Ruby, OCaml, Lua, a number of languages effectively used many to one um, scheduling. And um, a number of other systems use some variant of many to one, um, such as JavaScript and Rust, but they don't use kind of thread abstractions for that. They use other abstractions. <clears throat> um, the really cool thing about many to one is you could actually write your own threading library. So you could write a library in C that has a context switch code and implement your own M to one threading library, which is really cool. Um, there is a variant of um, M to one um, scheduling that actually says, yeah, actually, let's have multiple kernel threads backing the many user threads. And if one of those user threads makes a blocking call, then one of those kernel threads can block, but then another kernel thread could take over and execute for the rest of those user level threads. However, this requires a lot of synchronization between user level and kernel level in the sense that when the second kernel thread activates because the first one blocked, somehow it needs to know what register state to activate. It needs to know um, essentially how to run scheduling code. So this is not something that's trivial, that coordination. There are a lot of what we'll call in, in the future race conditions around deciding which thread is active at any point in time. Um, Solaris is the last system that I know of that last implemented this, um, but it's wonderful watching kind of the history of the implementation there because it they successively backed out of using many-to-many -many threads, um, or N-to-M threads as I call them, um, simply because of the complexity. And the last versions of Solaris um, did not actually use many-to-many. So this is, this kind of falls into the, the purview of like trying to get the benefit of user level threads while also getting the benefit of one-to-one -one threads, but paying in a huge amount of complexity. Um, the paper that we published tries to have the same goal, but it doesn't actually pay in that complexity. So feel free to watch that YouTube video. I think it's only 20 minutes um, on the GW Systems uh, YouTube page. What we're going to do, one of the things that we're going to talk about in class is the design of a Facebook web server. This is really just the design of a web server, but nobody thinks about web servers anymore. You just think about going to one of the superscalers um, web pages, um, Facebook being one of the superscaler. So let's think about a very simple system. Um, a system has a thread that reads and writes from the network. It receives requests from clients and um, writes, um, formulates some response um, and writes that response back to the client, right? Um, so this is all that a web server does, receive HTTP requests from a client, formulate some reply, and then sends the HTTP re uh, response back to the client. That's it, that's all that a web server does. Okay, so the big question that we're going to be struggling with is how does a web server retrieve and calculate the HTML, right? So when we receive the request, we need to formulate the HTML. How does it do that, right? Um, let's assume that to formulate the, re the response, it needs to block on, let's say, disk I.O., right? This may be more realistically some sort of a network request to another node within the cloud, um, but let's simplify it and let's just say that this is disk I.O., okay? So somehow it re needs to read the web pages that it's going to reply with back to the client from disk. It might need to perform some calculations to format that data. This is a very um, common thing when you have dynamic content that needs to be formulated. Um, and of course, it needs to send that HTML to the network thread to send it back to the client, right? Okay, when we're implementing the system, we have a number of goals, and we're going to ask about these goals as we implement different uh, if, as we look at different implementations of the system. 
Okay, so first throughput. Throughput is just trying to maximize the number of clients served per second, right? So one way to think about maximizing or optimizing for throughput is that you're trying to minimize overheads. So if there are more overheads, more kind of atoms involved and more expensive atoms, then you're going to be decreasing the throughput. Another thing that you want to maximize is reliability, right? If one part of the system fails, will the rest fail, right? This is part and parcel for what reliability is, right? Um, and the main way that we're going to think about increasing the reliability is by increasing fault isolation. So if you have things running in different processes, then one of them can fail without necessarily impacting the rest. Right? So this is how we're going to think about uh, maximizing for reliability. Um, another way to think about that is if a client has a malicious request that can trigger some bug within our parsing code, within some code within our server, um, then what can that impact? What other clients could that fault impact? And again, if it's in a separate process, it can impact the other client processes. Um, okay. So the first implementation is the simplest, and that's just a simple one-to-one -one thread within a process, single-threaded. This is kind of a process that we talked about previously in the system. And within this single thread, we are simply getting reads and writes from the network. We are then parsing the request, figuring out what HTTP request we need to formulate, reading from the disk, perform the calculations on what we retrieve from disk to formulate the actual HTTP HTML um, to send back, and then sending it back, right? Um, so the question is, where's this good? Where's this bad in terms of throughput, reliability? And I want to add another one on to their parallelism. Um, how effectively does this use an increasing number of cores within the system? Um, so please think about this. We'll talk about this in class. The second design, um, which Penny is very interested in, she's actually getting into the action this time, um, is a multi-process server. So this is, again, one-to-one -one threads, one per process, and trying to communicate between the processes using IPC, okay? So now we have a single process doing all the network I.O., talking to clients, and then passing the client request via IPC to a number of worker um, processes. So we get the, re the request off of the network, we send it via IPC to one of those workers. The worker actually accesses the disk, does the computation to formulate the reply, uses IPC to send the response back to the network I.O. process, and which then sends it back to the client. Okay. Now, there are a large number of questions for this one. One is, what if the... Um, each of, if each of these processes are using blocking or non-blocking means to talk to the system. So are they, for the networking I.O., is that blocking or non-blocking? If the disk is blocking or non-blocking, what does that mean for the overall performance of the system? Second, what if this IPC, the sends from the network process, what if those sends are blocking or non-blocking? What if the receives from the formulated replies from each of the workers are blocking or not blocking, right? Um, okay, all of these different decisions um, have impacts on the throughput, reliability, and parallelism. So this overall design, how does it do for reliability? The throughput, this overall design, how does it compare versus the first um, implementation, and if we switch different blocking or non-blocking options, um, how does it fare in terms of all of these? <clears throat> the last implementation that we want to look at is the same type of a structure. We have one thread in the system that is now talking to the network, to the clients, and it is using not IPC, not inner process communication, but inner thread coordination between itself and the different um, worker threads in the system. So everything that we talked about in the previous 
slide. Same thing here, but now there are different threads instead of different processes. So first, how does this impact the rely this general design impact the reliability versus the previous couple of options, right? And then um, if we're using different thread types and different blocking versus non-blocking communication with between threads and with the network and disk, um, how does that impact throughput, parallelism, and whatnot? So think about these a little bit, do some brainstorming, come up with your own answer. We'll spend a small amount of time in class going through each of these options. Um, and I want you to ask yourself, what is the best approach, right? Um, so that's the big question, right? Which is the best approach? And hopefully you remember the answer to this. I gave it to you before. Um, and we'll dive into that a little bit um, next class. All right. Thank you very much. This was a short one. Um, have a good day and prepare for class. Spend some extra time thinking about all of these. Thank you all. See you soon.